My name is John and uh, married to Penny, two kids. Uh, the picture up there is of me. <laughs> Going bald is a cruel joke. Um, it's nice not to worry about having hair though, I must be honest. I was just saying to Andy this morning, it's so lovely to be here together with you all. And uh, it's a family, it truly is. And it's not about us. We've come to worship God this morning. And slowly we'll get back into things, into the swing of things. It's going to take time, but it is lovely to see you all this morning. So thanks for coming and welcome to you all. This morning's reading, the opening reading is from Romans 1 verse 17. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. And that's that's the nugget, really, of, of the word of God, the, the truth that the righteous will live by faith. By faith only can we have a relationship with a loving father. Let's all stand and sing, King of Kings. I'm going to ask that we say this um, confession together, and as we know, it doesn't make us clean, Um, but it's a wonderful thing to do as as a family, is to admit that we fall far short of what, of God's perfection. Let's all say this together. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, we confess that we have sinned against you in our thoughts words and deeds and in what we have left undone lord have mercy on us forgive us our sins and help us that we may serve you better and please you more through jesus christ our lord amen amen Uh, we don't have too many pics just to remind you all that even if it's a small video or a picture of your garden just send them through to me or Myra or Andy. It's always lovely to see what you've been up to or what flowers are blooming in your garden. We don't have much today except to say that um, Clive and Felicia went to visit Don. And uh, you can apparently visit anyone at Greendale's, but you need to call Penny prior to, prior to visiting. So that's exciting that you can actually go and visit. And we'd encourage you to do that if you have anyone on your heart. Birthdays, Tilly Webster, Peter Hillier, Peter Fuhr online. Uh, I look forward to seeing you on your birthday. And Belinda Pike, that's quite something. 
28. I think she'll be 29. None, no anniversaries. Anyone here had an anniversary or having an anniversary that we should know about? Let us know. And then the annual vestry meeting. Andy, do you want to take over from me here? You might want to say a few things. Thanks, John, and uh, welcome to you, and welcome, especially if you're online, and especially, especially if this is your first time either here or online. It's great to have you with us. Yeah, just a couple of notices. The Vestry meeting is our annual general meeting, if you want to put it like that, our annual business meeting, where as members we get together just to thank God, ready for the year past, and to talk about plans for the future, and to elect office bearers for the next uh, year or so. And so do try and prioritize that. If you can be here physically, that's a bonus. But the vestry meeting, meeting will also be broadcast live. And you'll even be able to vote online if you're at home. So we can, we can accommodate uh, both, both congregations, really. We do have an online congregation out there and a physical congreg congregation here. But uh, just diarize that for the 18th of April. Um, Chill and Grill is on again tomorrow. So come along with your questions. And that will also be broadcast online, so you can even participate from home. And I've actually just been given a question this morning, so the questions have already started coming in for that. Come along, ask any question you like, and I'll have a go at trying to answer those for you. And then Jacques is organizing a men's get-together, a socially distanced braai here at the church um, on the 15th of May. So guys, you might want to just uh, make sure that you're around for that. I think it's a Saturday morning, so we're looking forward to that. There'll be um, a short passage from the Bible that we'll chat about and have a good time together um, over a braai. And then just our Easter plans coming up. Good Friday, of course, is this coming Friday. It's really come quickly, hasn't it? It certainly feels like that to me. And so we'll have a, a, a Good Friday service at 9.30 as usual on Friday morning, nothing in the evening. And then on Sunday, again, 9.30 in the morning as usual. But again, nothing uh, in the evening for, uh, for Easter Sunday. So just so that you can uh, know what's happening this coming weekend. We always say, don't we, bring hot cross buns. We'd love to share our hot cross buns afterwards. Well, you'll have to go home and enjoy your hot cross buns, I'm afraid. Um, I'm sure, uh, by the way, maybe I should say that right now. There's this whole, whole talk of lockdown coming before Easter weekend. Um, we'll have to let you know if they lock us down completely. I can't see that coming. I think what they're going to do is reduce church attendance from 50% of your building to 50 people. Um, so uh, at the moment, I would guess we've got about 40 here this morning. So actually nothing will change for us. Um, but uh, do, do make sure that you uh, are on the list, especially online folk. If you want to come in on Friday, uh, we need to know and uh, that, that you'll be here. Just in terms of offering, we don't uh, pass the, the plates around, the bags around, but that doesn't mean that uh, giving isn't important. Um, we have got a box at the entrance. Our giving is part of our worship. It's, it's a foregone conclusion that Christians will give generously and sacrificially. That's just what the New Testament assumes uh, from Christians. Of course, in the Old Testament, it was 10% of your income. and in the New Testament, that changes to being generous and sacrificial. And so we trust that you'll continue in your worship of God by uh, giving to his kingdom and his kingdom work. Uh, online, of course, EFTs, um, are, you can give via our banking details there or on the website. Um, but uh, we do need to, as they say, keep the lights on. And not just, we don't want to just maintain, do we, during this lockdown. We want you to see the kingdom really grow as I think people examine their hearts and are faced with their mortality at this time. And so if you can be generous in that, we'd be very grateful. Taffy is going to be leading us in prayer. So Taffy, great to see you in person and great to have you leading us this morning in prayer. If you want to use that microphone. Thanks, Taffy. Let's just uh, bow together in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning as the one and only true God. The God who is almighty, all-powerful, and all-forgiving. The God who created the whole universe with just three words. Let there be, 
and there was and still is. We come to you today in a true spirit of repentance and faith to lay the sins of the recent past at the foot of the cross in complete faith that you will remove them from us as far as the east is from the west and give us a clean slate to take with us into the future. Yet, Lord, we know that because we are who we are, that that slate will never be entirely clean. But because you are a loving God, we know that all you ask is that we try and keep on trying. So, Lord, help us to do that, knowing that when we fall down, you will be there to pick us up. And now, Father, we continue to pray for your intervention in the problem of this vital pandemic. Lord, we know that nothing happens without you either cause it or allow it. And throughout history, you have used war and or pestilence to remind the world of who and what you are and that you will not tolerate man's waywardness forever. But Lord, we pray that in your power and your mercy, you will say enough is enough and call a rapid halt to the progress of the virus and that at last mankind will begin to do things your way and not ours. In the meantime, Lord, we pray for those in the firing line, doctors, nurses, and hospital staff, that you will protect and strengthen them. And we pray that the vaccines will be totally effective and that they will be fairly distributed. And now, Lord, we pray for our country, which has been torn apart by those who have betrayed the trust of their people and feathered their own nests to an appalling extent. Father, we pray that your justice will prevail. The punishment will fit the crime and that the end result will be repentance and salvation. Finally, Lord, we pray for our church leaders, for their diligence and zeal, and we ask that they will always strive to preach your word above all things, so that it will go out from every pulpit with convicting power. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Sefi. Well, we're going to sing again, but before we do that, or should I say while we do that, you might want to grab yourselves a Bible. I haven't seen this for about a year, and it dawned on me this morning. Um, There are Bibles on the side, so if you want to grab yourselves a Bible, and in fact, if you want to put your hand up, John, that lovely young man you saw on the screen before, uh, he will bring you a Bible. So if you you want a Bible, we are going through the Book of Romans, which is jam-packed and very technical in its sense and structure. So it might help to have the words open in front of you. Put your hand up while we sing. John will bring you a Bible. Let's stand and sing above all powers, um, above all kings. And we, of course, singing about the Lord Jesus Christ.
Won't you take a seat? And Rosemary and Deirdre are going to bring us our readings this morning. Good morning. Our first reading is taken from the book of Leviticus, reading selected verses from chapter 16. The Lord said to Moses, Tell your brother Aaron that he is not to come whenever he chooses into the most holy place, behind the curtain, in front of the atonement cover on the ark, or else he will die. For I will appear in the cloud over the atonement cover. From the Israelite community, he is to take two male goats for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. Then he is to take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the entrance to the tent of meeting. He is to cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. Aaron shall bring the goat whose lot falls to the Lord and sacrifice it for a sin offering. He is to lay both hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the wickedness and rebellion of the Israelites, all their sins, and put them on the goat's head. He shall send the goat away into the wilderness in the care of someone appointed for the task. The goat will carry on itself all their sins to a remote place and the man shall release it in the wilderness. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. The New Testament reading is taken from Romans 3, starting at verse 21. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe, there is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time, so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Where then is boasting? It is excluded. Because of what law? The law that requires works? No, because of the law that requires faith. For we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles too? Yes, of Gentiles too, since there is only one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through the same faith. Do we then nullify the law by this faith? 
Not at all. Rather, we uphold the law. This is the word of God. Amen. Thanks be to God. Thank you very much, ladies, for bringing us those readings. Well, friends, we're working through the book of Romans. Uh, we're in chapter 3, as you heard, at the end of chapter 3 uh, today. And uh, I've entitled today's talk, Righteousness Through Faith Alone. I hope that came out loud and clear. It struck me, especially as Deirdre was reading. Let me go back there. Um, I wouldn't have written this um, like this if I was Paul and if I wasn't thinking in a gospel light. He, he writes there, um, he will justify the third line down. God will justify the circumcised, that is the Jew. How will God justify the Jew? By faith, not by obedience, not by law keeping, but by faith. That is how God will justify the Jew. And what about the Gentile? And the Gentile, the uncircumcised, that same faith. <laughs> so what is God looking for from Jew or Gentile? It doesn't really matter. Faith, the same faith. He's looking for faith, for trust, that we would trust him. So righteousness comes through faith alone. If that's all you hear about the sermon, if this is all you remember, it's enough. It's enough. Well, friends, many countries in the world today are struggling with immigration crises as uh, people arrive in neighboring countries uh, desperate for a better life. The trouble is, if you arrive as a refugee without a visa, life is very, very difficult, as we all well know. You can't get citizenship. You can't benefit from all the privileges and the protection that the natural citizens enjoy. To qualify as a citizen, you normally have to prove that you don't have a criminal record, and you have to show that you embrace the culture and the customs of this new country that you want to become a citizen of. Some countries even make you write an exam on the customs and the history of that country. Uh, some countries, I heard, I think Holland, you actually have to learn Dutch if you want to become a citizen of Holland. You have to submit to your new country's laws, and you have to promise to work for its prosperity if you want to become a citizen in a new country. Now, there are many parallels with trying to become a citizen of a new country and becoming a citizen of heaven. It's only possible to qualify for heaven if your life is morally free from any criminal record. And if you can show that you will submit to the laws of heaven and that you will honor the king of heaven, and that you will work for the prosperity of that king and his kingdom. At which point, you and I might as well just give up, because we're all doomed. We fail at every one of those points. We are riddled with immorality. We have all rebelled against the king of heaven. We openly defy his law, and, and truth be told, we work against his will and his purposes for the world. So, so far in Romans, we've seen that whether we're immoral and proud of it, or living a so-called decent and respectable life, or if we're devoutly religious and maybe even hold an office in the church or in the mosque or the synagogue, Paul has basically demolished any hope that any of us can have of ever getting into heaven, because basically we have disqualified ourselves. And Paul has been saying, if you read the first three chapters, that there are no exceptions to this. No, not one. The whole human race is in desperate trouble. Whether we uh, wherever we come from and whatever kind of people we are, we are all in desperate trouble. That has been the message. And so in chapter 3, verse 10, he concludes that there is no one righteous, not even one. Not even the most devout Jew who does his or her best to keep God's law. And that's because, Paul says, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. That's because the law simply cannot make you righteous. That's not the reason that the law was given. That's not the purpose of the law. So what was the purpose of the law? Why did God give us the Ten Commandments? Well, Paul answers that as he finishes verse 20. Through the law, we become conscious of sin. That's the purpose of the law. Just like the law of South Africa, 
God's law also can't make you perfect. It can't make you righteous. It can only point out your failures and make you conscious of your sin. So this means that we are all like disqualified, excluded immigrants trying to get into heaven. We might even be desperate to get into heaven, but because of our blemished moral record, because of our rejection of heaven's king, the Lord Jesus Christ, we've taken the decision out of God's hands and we have excluded ourselves. So that's the bad news. That's the bad news of chapter 1 through to chapter 3, verse 20. And Paul has also been saying that this bad news is precisely why all the nations of the world need to hear the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's because in the gospel, God generously makes his perfectness, his righteousness, he makes it available to us in the gospel. That's the verse that John started our service with. In the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. The righteousness of God is offered to a sinful, rebellious world. It's available to us if we want it. If we can get our hands on God's righteousness, this perfectness, then disqualified people like you and me can now at last become qualified for heaven, made righteous. The gospel means that there is now a way for sinful human beings to be made acceptable, to be qualified, to actually be welcomed into heaven. Well, the bad news has ended as far as Paul comes. Uh, we're in serious trouble with God. The situation is completely hopeless. But now, that's how this, verse, this week's passage started. Did you notice? But now, here comes the good news. He starts verse 21 with those two words. But now, against the backdrop of the darkness and the hopelessness and the bad news that we've all disqualified ourselves, but now, here comes the good news. It's amazing news. It's wonderful news. Paul says something amazing has happened. Listen again to verses 21 and 22. But now, says Paul, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. In other words, this new this news that of God justifying sinners is actually there in the Old Testament. The law and the prophets testified to the day when God would accept sinners on the basis of faith. In fact, that's the only way God has ever ever accepted anyone in the bible it's always been on the basis of faith not obedience he says in verse 22 this righteousness is given through faith not obedience through faith in jesus christ to all who believe can you see what god is looking for from you and i this morning he wants us to believe. He wants us to put our faith, our trust, our hope, our dependence on Jesus Christ, he says. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Jew, Gentile, devout Muslim, devout um, Hindu. It doesn't matter who you are. All who believe, he says, that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the Lord. This righteousness of God, this perfectness of God that he's offering to give us, it's the good life that you and I need if we want to get into heaven one day. And God provides it for us in Christ. You see, God loves us so passionately, even though we've rebelled against him. And because he wants us to be with him forever so badly, even though we've shown that we're not interested in him, that he offers his own righteous life in the place of our unrighteous life. In other words, God is offering us a visa to get into heaven as a legitimate citizen. He's actually offering us more than just a visa to get in and then have to leave. He's offering us full citizenship. Actually, it's even better than that. He's offering us full adoption as his children in his home. That is what's on the table if we're interested. Now, 
It's all very well being offered this visa by God, but how do we take possession of it? God's holding it out. How do I take possession of it? Especially if it's an invisible God holding it out to me. Well, that's what this passage is all about. And the first point we'll see is that we are justified freely through faith by grace. Wow. Three big religious words there, aren't they? Justified, faith. Grace. I mean, we could preach a sermon on each one of those big religious words, but they're all there in verses 22 through to 24. Let me read it again. This righteousness is given through faith. There's the first word in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. All have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace. Justified freely by his grace we've all sinned said paul we've all failed we've fallen short of the glory of god we might look respectable enough on a sunday morning but actually none of us have lived up to the standard that god wants from people who hope to become his children and so god's plan is to justify us what does that mean it simply means to declare you not guilty That's what God wants to do for you, to declare you not guilty. And he does that by giving us the righteousness that we don't have naturally. And he says that this righteousness can come to you freely through faith in Jesus Christ. The word faith is almost a useless word now. Because most people have completely the wrong idea of what the Bible means when it talks about faith. Most people think that faith means make-believe naivety, that, that you have to just believe in something irrational and some improbable fantasy like fairies or UFOs, something that's long been uh, disproved by science. People think faith means you've got to believe something that's unprovable, that's, that's just improbable some far-fetched story. No, that's not what faith in the Bible means. Faith that Paul is talking about here doesn't mean wishful thinking. It means trusting in truth. Trusting in truth. Write that in your Bible somewhere when you get home. Faith means trusting in truth. Faith means trusting something that's always been true no matter how you or I feel about it. And friends, everyone's got faith of some sort or another. Even the devil has got faith. Did you know that? You might not believe in God. You might have an atheistic faith. You may not believe that there's life after death. Well, that's your faith. That's what you believe. Or your faith might be of a religious nature, a religious faith. You might believe that if you observe the five pillars of Islam, or if you get baptized and take communion, well, then that will qualify you for for paradise. Well, that is your faith. But whether you're a religious person or not, we all have some sort of belief about the future. And Christian faith is simply trusting in Jesus Christ's works rather than my own works to get me to heaven. But here's the thing. It's not the strength of your faith that counts. It's the object of your faith that God looks at. Thank goodness. Imagine if God only lets people into heaven who had huge amounts of faith. Well, he doesn't. Remember Thomas? Uh, Remember the disciples battled with faith. And remember the man whose child was sick, help me in my unbelief, he says to Jesus. It's not the strength of your faith that gets you to heaven, the object of your faith. Think about it like this. If you really, really want to go to America, having a real visa in your hand is the only thing that counts. You only need enough faith to put your hand into your handbag and pull out the visa. Pulling out a wad of cash won't help, or shouldn't. Some border posts, it really does help. But pulling out money and and displaying your wealth shouldn't impress the customs official. Pulling out your family tree and showing your pedigree, well, that's not going to help you. Pulling out your CV and, and showing how successful you've been in life, well, that won't get you in. What you need is a visa. 
And faith is like the hand that pulls out the visa. Faith is the hand that takes hold of the visa. No one gets into America or Australia and goes around boasting that it was their hand that got them in. No, it was the visa in their hand that got them in. I'm not saved by my faith. I'm saved by my visa. Faith is just the act of trusting in the visa and trusting in what Jesus did in his life and death and trusting that that was enough to get you into heaven. So have you put your trust in Jesus yet? Also, did you notice the word freely in verse 24? All are justified freely by God's grace. Freely means undeservedly. In other words, God doesn't give his righteousness, his perfectness to people as a reward for good behavior. No, he gives his righteousness to people as a gift to anyone, he says, who starts trusting in Jesus. Righteousness is a gift, not a reward. You see, God is a loving and generous and gracious God. He gives us gifts that we don't earn and that we don't deserve. He offers us salvation, not because we deserve it, not because we're lovable, but because he is loving. So God is offering you the gift of his righteousness this morning. You might still have questions. Who doesn't? You might still have doubts. Who doesn't? But just a visa on its own is useless unless you reach out and take it from the person who's offering it to you. So God's righteousness is useless to you unless you reach out and take it from him. Who offers it to you. So have you done that? Is God's salvation still in God's hand? Or is it in your hand? Have you taken it? God is offering you his righteousness. Regardless of how good or bad or religious you might have been. The only thing God is looking for from you. Is to decide to put your trust in Jesus Christ. Well, secondly, in that passage, Paul goes on, he says, we're justified freely through faith by grace, and we're justified freely through faith by his blood. So at this point, you might be saying, okay, Andy, I understand that God is offering me this righteousness. That sounds great. Maybe it sounds too good to be true. But how does that work? How can God make me acceptable to him at no cost at all? Well, friends, our salvation might come freely to us, but it didn't come at no cost to God. It came at the price of Jesus' blood when he offered himself as a sacrifice of atonement for my sins. That's what it says in verses 24 and 25. We are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. Now, redemption just means being set free from slavery through the payment of a price, the payment of a ransom, being set freely from slavery through the payment of a ransom. Like Michael Scott Moore, who was kidnapped by Somali pirates in 2012, they demanded 20 million US dollars and they kept him a hostage for, wait for it, 977 days. Eventually, three and a half years and one and a half million dollars later, he was returned to his family. That's what redemption means. That's what being redeemed means, being set free from slavery through the payment of a ransom price. Can you imagine the joy of that man returning to his family after three and a half years? The joy of having been redeemed. But actually, the classic example of someone being redeemed in the Bible is the nation of Israel in the book of Exodus. You may remember they were slaves, not for three and a half years. They were slaves for 400 years before they were set free. That time, the ransom price was the lives of the Passover lambs. The Passover is a picture of how you and I can also be rescued by God, not from Egypt, 
but from our sins and from death and from judgment. And the ransom for our redemption is not the life of a sacrificial lamb or one and a half million US dollars. It was the life of a sacrificial God, the Lord Jesus Christ. God became a man and went to the cross and he became our ransom price. He became our sacrificial lamb. He suffered the punishment we deserve for the way we treat God and treat one another. And so the price has been completely paid. The ransom has been paid to set us free from condemnation and punishment. So friends, never mind the joy of being set free after three and a half years or even 400 years. If you've been redeemed, you've been set free from an eternity of slavery. If you've been redeemed, you've been set free from the condemnation of your sins. You've been accepted by the God you offended. It's no wonder that Christians sing more than any other community in the world. Christians, whenever they get together, have you noticed that? We always sing. Why? We have been redeemed. Now, there are two sides to redemption. I need you to. Get your thinking caps on. It's dense, isn't it? Romans is hard work. But man, it does reward hard work. There are two sides to redemption. One side is the effect, the result of redemption. The other side is the means of redemption, how redemption works. There's a great illustration of these two sides of redemption in the Old Testament, in the passage that was read for us from Leviticus 16. One day a year, the high priest would offer two goats for the sins of Israel. Chosen by Lot, one goat had all the sins of the people confessed over it, and then it was driven out into the wilderness, symbolic, uh, symbolizing Israel's sins being taken away taken away to a remote place, never to be seen again. The technical word for this is expiation. Expiation. The goat became the scapegoat, and it expiated Israel's sins, took the sins away. It was a picture of the day when one day God the Son, Jesus, would become our scapegoat and take our sins away and wipe our record clean. That's the first side of the coin, the effect or the result of redemption. Your sins get expiated. Your sins get taken away. But there's more to that. Our sins aren't just swept under the carpet. They don't just get expiated. That would be a travesty of justice, wouldn't it? Imagine if God just took your sins and my sins and Hitler's sins and swept them under the carpet and said, never mind, let's pretend that never happened. It would be a complete travesty of justice. Our sins are not only expiated, they are propitiated. You thought it was going to get easier. That is the other side of the coin. Expiated, your sins get taken away. Propitiated, your sins get what they deserve. As you heard in the reading, there was a second goat, a propitiation goat. This goat would be offered as a sacrifice for the sins that were taken away by the first goat, the scapegoat. The second goat died in the place of the people of Israel. If the first goat expiated Israel's sins, took them away, then the second goat propitiated Israel's sins. It was punished in their place for their sins. It was a picture of their sins getting what they deserved, of justice being done. You see, God never sweeps sins under the carpet. They get punished, but the sinner doesn't need to be punished. Not if they've got a substitute. And that's what Jesus came to do for us on the cross. He took away our sins. He expiated them. But he did it by, by being punished in our place to satisfy his own justice. He propitiated our sins. In other words, he did the job of both goats. He did the job of the first goat, took the sins away, by doing the job of the second goat, which was to die in the place of God's people. 
This big word, propitiation, is translated with three words in our English Bibles, the sacrifice of atonement. If you see that in your Bible, it's actually one word in the Greek. And it's just, it's just that the word propitiation isn't used very often these days. And so the translators try and help us by giving us a little sentence in the place of the word. It's there in verse 25. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement, a propitiation through the shedding of his blood, just like the shedding of that other goat in Leviticus 16. It means that Jesus' death satisfies God's wrath and satisfies God's justice. Just like a giant lightning rod, Jesus hung on the cross and God's wrath was poured out on him instead of us because he loves us. You see, God does not sweep sins under the carpet. Instead, he came as a man to make sure justice was done. He came as a man to give the law what the law demands. He came as a man to make sure that the law was fulfilled. In fact, he says that twice there in verses 25 and 26. He did this to demonstrate his justice, sorry, his righteousness, because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. And he did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time, so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus Christ. So on the cross, Jesus, Paul says, didn't just pay for your sins and my sins. He was also paying for the sins of people like Abraham and Moses, who trusted God back in their own time. Verse 25 says, their sins had been left unpunished all those years until Jesus came. God came and took his own punishment on himself to fulfill the requirements of his own law. Man, shall I say that again? God came and took his own punishment on himself to fulfill the requirements of his own law. That way, God remains just. Unjust people like Abraham and you and I are justified and justice is served all at the same time. God is the just justifier of the unjust. As John Stott, that wise old man used to say, God, the just justifier of the unjust. God never lets anyone off their sins, but he does offer to pay for your sins himself. Well, lastly this morning, we are justified freely through faith alone, alone. Let's read verse 27 together. Where then is boasting, says Paul? It is excluded because of what law? The law that requires works? No, because of the law that requires faith. For we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles too? Yes, of Gentiles too, since there is only one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through that same faith. Do we then nullify the law by this faith? Not at all. We uphold the law. You see, boasting happens when you want the world to see what you've achieved. It's confidence in yourself. It's self-belief, if you like. In, the West, in our Western culture, we really value self-belief, don't we? I mean, Donald Trump just epitomizes self-belief. And we see that in the message that our world sends to our young children, our young people. Here's just one example of hundreds, okay? If you can imagine it, you can achieve it. Nonsense. <laughs> Nonsense. You ask almost anyone who has ever achieved great things, and they will tell you that they never imagined that it would be possible, that they never imagined that they would one day be the president of Microsoft or whatever. If you can dream it, you can become it. Well, maybe, yes, in dreamland. 
that is true. Friends, there's lots of things I dream and I can never become them. Running as fast as Usain Bolt, you know, it's never going to happen. Now, of course, we shouldn't be crushing our children's dreams, but this nonsense is just not true. It's setting them up actually for failure, and it will leave them crushed and feeling worthless. And I blame the sound of music for all of this. Do you remember the words that Julie Andrews sings? I have confidence the world can all be mine. They all have to agree I have confidence in me. And it gets worse. All I trust I leave my heart to. All I trust becomes my own. I have confidence and confidence alone. Besides which you see, I have confidence in me. Well, for Paul, having confidence in me is abhorrent. And he rightly says in verse 27 that justification by grace through faith in Christ excludes all boasting. Because justification is not about what we do for God. It's about what God has done for us. Paul is not saying that we can't be confident, mind you. We can be full of confidence that God will accept us as long as we are confident in what Jesus did on our behalf. What does he say in verse 28? Our confidence must be apart from the works of the law. We are not to put any hope in our good works or any religious rituals or rites or anything that we think will be to our credit. Boasting, says Paul, is excluded. There are no celebrities in the Christian church as Hillsong have recently learned so painfully, if you've read the whole Hillsong crash and burn in New York, the only celebrity in the Christian church is Jesus Christ. There's only one hero in the Bible. The rest of us are broken, flawed failures, truth be told, who have been rescued and redeemed by God. And this is all by his grace alone through faith in Christ alone, to the glory of God alone. Well, let me wrap up. It's only in Christ that you and I have any hope of getting into heaven when we've finished our lives here on earth. God offers every single human being a visa for heaven, but it has to be received as a gift, not a reward. All God is looking for, for from you is for us to acknowledge our need of a savior who will come and pay for our sins. And the Lord Jesus Christ came to do exactly that. If you're not planning on accepting Christ, if you have some other better plan to get to heaven, I'd love to hear it sometime. But for now, the best plan I know of is the offer of righteousness that God is making you today to make you fit and qualified for heaven. So what do you want to do? Put your faith in Jesus and accept the righteousness of God? Or keep singing along with Julie Andrews, I have confidence in me. Let's pray. Well, Almighty God, we confess that we love putting our confidence in ourselves. And we always try to justify our failings. Thank you for telling us that this won't work and that we are disqualified from heaven. Thank you that Jesus was obedient even to death and that his death on the cross was the full and final payment for all our crimes against you. So, Lord, we ask you for just enough faith to place in Christ instead of ourselves. Please help us to depend on him for our salvation and no longer on ourselves. Please give us the joy from realizing that we've been redeemed. And please give us freedom from anxiety and guilt and looking down on others. And we pray this all in Jesus' name and for his glory alone. Amen. Well, we're going to finish by singing a wonderful song, From Heaven You Came, which really tells us the story of Jesus Christ. Let's stand and sing together.
so much for coming coming thanks bron it was wonderful helping us sing our praises um friends just in case you didn't hear uh, wayne horner passed away yesterday went to be with the lord um also do keep praying for ian a, a, a dad from our evening congregation who's critically ill with covid um, really it needs a miracle if he's ever going to come out of that hospital so pray for ian pray for glenn horner who's mourning the wife of wayne um, last week, for those online, uh, the community chat was a disaster. I was on the desk at the back, and I messed it up completely. But this week, we're hoping for better things. So John will be hosting you if you're online, and uh, he'll catch up with all of you uh, online. Well, let's finish with these words. Have a look at these words again. I don't think we can ever hear these words enough. Now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Well, if you're online, stay online. John will be with you in a second. Um, otherwise, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Uh, can I encourage you to do the talking outside, not because we want to get rid of you, but because of ventilation uh, and its safety. So thank you for being with us. It's been a blessing being with you this morning. Can anyone hear me? Yes, yes we can hear you. You sound good, especially with that hair of yours. Huh? Yeah, that's yes, you. you know what, Mark and Colleen, I knew you'd stay on to know. <laughs> I'm not actually sure how this all, I'm not actually sure how this all this tech works because I'm still in the back of the church and I'm on my phone and on a laptop, so I don't know which one to abandon. Um, John, maybe mute the laptop that's at the back of the church because we can hear the piano coming through there and we can't hear each other too well. Okay, how do I do that? Well done, Doug. Okay, so, try that, on the laptop that's plugged into the sound desk. There we go. That's yeah. better. Can you hear me now? Oh, that sounds well much better. Well done, Dougie Doug. Well done, Doug. <laughs> yeah, sure. Doug, should I make you panelist as well? Would that help in case I get cut off? <laughs> um, I'm actually already co-host, John. Um, <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. I can see that. All right. Brilliant. <laughs> Jana, this is a, after that sermon to now worry about buttons and... <laughs> I thought it was a fantastic sermon, though. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we we must yeah. agree with you. Thank it was, you. It was wonderful. We're going to send it to all our family overseas. It was wonderful. It was really super. Thank you, Andy. Well, thank you, Andy. Wow. Um. So, Mike and Colleen, I think you the and you and Penny are the only two, and Doug. Doug, my, and if I go, <laughs> I think everyone else found out that I was hosting, and they've all postponed. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you, if they could have seen that photograph, they would have been frightened away. <laughs> hey, Mike, I miss I you. You'd, I really... I thought you'd, you'd taken a tennis, you know, because that's the, that's the hairstyle of the young tennis players these days. Eh? In fact, you look like one of the young players. I can't think who it is. I just want to I ask, Doug, 
Mm. Yeah. Now, I'll start a question. Yeah. Absolutely. How did you enjoy the doozy and how did you go? Um, so oh, you didn't do it. Sorry. Yes, yeah, I didn't do it. I'm here in Stellenbosch, but yeah, uh, Rob did it. Sorry, yeah. And yeah, yeah he's uh, actually Rob, arrived no, back sorry, in Stellenbosch now. Too. So he, um, yeah, but he said he absolutely loved it. He has such a great race. He didn't swim at all. He didn't fall out of his boat. Oh, that's fantastic. And yeah, he just loved it. He really, really enjoyed it. Oh, that's great. Eh? Oh, good. Shane, I'm so glad. You must have been terribly sad to miss it. Eh? Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, oh, gosh. I'm yeah, thinking. no, I was, I was so bleak, but I was following every single second. I was... <laughs> yeah, looking at all the updates, and yeah, I got no work done for those three days. <laughs> <laughs> Gosh, Doug. Yeah. Oh, well. Mm-hmm. Is, Doug, can you just help me quickly? So, if I go into the participants list, everyone's in the panelists list as opposed to the attendees. How's that happen? Um, so, <laughs> I did that, John. Um, as soon as the service was in, I cool. made everyone panelists. That they're Isn't able to turn on their video. Leave. I want to see so what's happening. No. Everyone that is online now is able to turn on their video and mic if they want to. Jeez, that's fantastic, Doug. Okay, so I'm learning. This is great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so normally um, how it works is as soon as the service ends, Shane and I do that together. And he starts from the bottom of the list, I start from the top, and we make everyone a panelist just so that they can okay. control. Yeah, if anyone yes. else is out there and is still watching on Zoom, please feel free to turn on your videos. Um, you should have the ability to do that on your end. Um, can I ask Arthur Duncan if he's still live? I see he's there. Arthur, can you um, unmute your mic or if can you um, undo your camera or come online if you're willing to? I saw that you received an award recently for your cycling. Okay, I see Arthur's there, but... Maybe new for Arthur and Zoe to come online. That's fine. Well, I must say, Arthur told told us that he, that they would see us at the service. So I'm hoping that they they are listening at the same time because, as you know, John and Zoe is my my cousin, and we are very no. proud of Arthur for his achievements too. Eh? That's incredible. Well, maybe he, maybe Zoe they were at the service then that they aren't online. Maybe they were at the service. No, but then no, that they would have known that. Uh, anyway, hi Amy. Hello. Hi. Amy. How are you? I'm good. I'm actually heading out just now to go to Cape Town to go to a market with friends. So that's going to be exciting. Ah, uh, lovely. She must be excited about that too. Yeah. Thanks for that. Yeah, haven't seen that's fantastic. Now. Yeah. And how's your man? <laughs> yeah, he's good. Um, coming up for a holiday soon, and he's hopefully going to come with me to visit home again. So, uh, lovely. I'll actually be able to bring him to church and he can meet everyone. Lovely. When is that holiday planned for, Amy? Um, I think we fly on the 16th of April. Okay. Isn't Fran going to be home at the same time, I think? Oh, no. Fran, Fran arrives on the 24th of April, and she's oh, here okay. for about a week or so. Yeah. Oh, okay. Cool. That'll be lovely. How long will Shots. you be here for, Amy? Um, I'll be here until, I think, the 1st of May. Um, we've got a two-week school holiday. Simon's only coming for a few days, though. Okay. Lovely. Sure. Yeah. And, Doug, are you coming home at all? No. No, I won't be coming home for, for this first. Yeah. Probably June, July. Okay. Uh, look forward to that, Doug. Mm. Is, is there anyone else who wants to I see no I think her laptops isn't that one of the church laptops registered as it might be yeah no that that, sh- that should be her um I can recognize our living room in the background there but yeah it the webcam just needs to be tilted down so that we can see who's who's sitting there can't respond yeah no <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I'm able to. No, I can't unmute anything. Okay. Cool. I will listen. Lovely checking your. Is there anyone else who wants to come online and say a few words or say hi? I'm going to go over after this service. I'm going to go over to Amber Valley Pen and just visit Nick and Bunny. Nick Punye. Okay. 
because he yeah. hasn't been too well. And I'll just sneak in there and say hi to him. Purden goes over every Sunday morning and the two of them, Nick and Purden, listen to the service. Bunny goes off and does her shopping at that yeah. time. But it'll be lovely to see Nick, see yeah. Purden mm. again. Okay, good. Two oldies in their 90s, mid-90s. Yeah, it's incredible. And they're just so bright. Their minds are still so keen. But body's mm. failing them. Yeah. Yeah, Lovely to see you all this morning. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Amy, I love to Frank and have a lovely day. Thank you. Yeah, we'll do. <laughs> Doug, can I sign off? Um, yeah, you are able to. I don't think anyone else is going to be turning on their, yeah, turning on their webcams for today. But yeah. Cheers, cheers, Mark and Colleen. Cheers, everyone. Just make sure you end the meeting on the church left, left off at the back as well. Okay, I, I think it'll be backing up, possibly. So I'll leave that to <laughs> Ryan. Thank, thank you, bit. John. Okay, Thanks cheers, guys. Much, John. So nice to see you all. <laughs> uh, and you, Doug. Uh, Mark said you look very naughty. You do. You look like your dad, actually. <laughs> 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 no, he was, no, he you was look, naughty. You look now. a lot naughtier than your dad. <laughs> <laughs> cheers, guys. Oh, oh my oh, goodness. I'm going to get really castigated. <laughs> you will. How are your oh, studies okay. going, Doug, by the way? Are your studies going well? Um, yeah, I'm actually not studying at the moment. I'm working this year. Yeah. Oh, I well, see. Yeah. Oh. No, that, that oh, well, answers us anyway. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, I'm doing this. Well, that's great. Oh, so nice to see anyway, you. Anyway, lovely to see you guys. Yes, yeah, and you guys. Okay, <laughs> bye-bye, everyone. See you all next time. Bye-bye, Cheers. Bye. Have a lovely day. You too. Bye.